that. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our architecture series and to our third lecture of the series in this semester. Um, we have been organizing lectures as Academic Association of the Faculty of Architecture of Warsaw University of Technology for a few years now, and are now doing it as part of our academia's activities, which is based in Oshidle Yazdu, a beautiful green place in the heart of Warsaw. If you'd like to support our activities and uh, the maintenance of Oshidle Yazdu, you can do so through our Patreonite. The link where you can do so will be included in the online stream description. I would also like to thank our media partners and patrons who help us promote uh, our events and reach as many interested. We are very grateful for the cooperation of uh, Warsaw University of Technology, uh, the Association of Polish Architects SARP, Fundacja Benzmiana, Magazyn Rzut, Magazyn Notes na Sześcigodni, Radio UJFM, and uh, last but not least, uh, Magazin Architektura Murata. Today, uh, we are honored to have with us Mr. Tim Stoner of Space Syntax, based in UK, London. Uh, Tim is an architect and urban planner who has devoted his career to the analysis and design of human behavior patterns, the ways in which people move, interact, and transact in buildings and urban places. He is an internationally recognized expert in the design of spatial layouts, and in particular, the role of space in the generation of social, economic, and environmental value. Tim was appointed managing director of Space Syntax in 1995. He has led the company from its origins at University College London to its position today as practice operating globally. He is a founding member and recent director of the Academy of Urbanism, a visiting professor at the Barlett School of Architecture, a Harvard Loeb Fellow and Deputy Chair of the UK Design Council. The, uh, today's lecture is titled Cities as Transaction Machines, Principles, Challenges, Technologies and Opportunities in Urban Planning Practice. In his talk, Tim will discuss the urban planning and design principles behind the space syntax approach, as well as some key challenges in contemporary urbanism. So uh, without further prolonging, I would now like to welcome the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture uh, of uh, Warsaw University of Technology, Mr. Krzysztof Koszewski, whom we would also like to uh, thank for his support. So the floor is yours, or rather the screen is yours. Hey, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it's my great pleasure to open this lecture by Professor Tim Stoner. And uh, I'm really glad, and uh, this is a great satisfaction that we have you here. And uh, I believe that uh, the term space syntax, which we are, of course, familiar with, will uh, be present through your presentation and your lecture. And uh, I personally see space syntax as a kind of desire to find solid foundation for our design decisions. And this uh, reference we seek uh, is deeply rooted in human behavior, which is a, a driving force of our designs and actually makes the sense of architecture and urban planning. That's why I believe this is the core of, of our activities. Also, I'm uh, personally very interested in uh, um, data processing uh, uh, for using in a special analysis. And also from the point of view, not only the data processing, but data acquiring uh, uh, using uh, sensors of Internet of Things, uh, which uh, are everywhere around and all the uh, questions that arise uh, while we uh, acquire this uh, data and how can we use it even more? How can we use uh, the sensors or Internet of Things as the idea uh, in our design, not only as a supplier of data, but also as a kind of uh, infrastructure changer in, um, in our cities? So uh, from these points of view, uh, I uh, really await your presentation and lecture and, uh, and I find the topic really exciting and interesting. So thank you very much that you agreed to be with us and the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Dean. And um, thank you to everyone for joining and to the organizers for making this happen. I would like to start with an apology. Uh, the, the fact we're starting late is my mistake and um, I got my diary wrong, but it's been a busy day um, of space syntax practice, which is really the subject that I'd like to focus on this evening. Um, how do we turn academic theory into professional practice? And that's been the story of my career and the story of the careers of my colleagues in Space Syntax, the company that uh, grew out of the Bartlett School, University College London in uh, the late 1980s. Um, and ever since then, that story of practice has been one that has fed back into the world of academia. And although it's not the lecture that I, I plan to give tonight, it's a story that we may wish to discuss after I've spoken about the relationship between teaching, research and practice, because for me, the three cannot be separated. And what I often enjoy most is discovering something in practice that is a question I can't answer and that I need to refer back to my colleagues in the research group, the Space Intact Laboratory at UCL, um, who can then help me think about it. Uh, it's a wonderful relationship. But this evening, I want to talk about the theory of space syntax. I'm going to cover some of the basic mathematics. Um, what I really want to talk about, though, are challenges and, and the emergencies, indeed, that we face as practitioners. Um, and I'd like to use some case studies uh, these will be mostly projects that uh, have either been built or are being built. Um, urbanism, architecture and urbanism, I have realized is a long game. Uh, it takes a long time from the first idea to the opening of the building. And some buildings never open, some ideas never happen. But I want to share with you some uh, some projects that have, that we've learned from. I'd like to talk about ev evolution in theory, how we never stand still. And I'd like, if we can get to it, to share with you some of the ideas we're currently working on, um, which uh, may or may not um, see the light of day in terms of technological developments. So uh, let me share my slides and um, get into this. And I've titled uh, this talk Cities as Transaction Machines um, for reasons which I'll describe further, but in essence, the city is a, a mixing device that brings people together. And the benefit of people coming together is massive. And that's why we have cities. For me, the main, most important characteristic of the city is that it generates transactions. Transactions which are possible, but not as easy and not as high quality when they're online. And as I, uh, as I like to do in these circumstances, I'd like to acknowledge and dedicate this talk to Professor Bill Hillier, the original pioneer of space syntax, who sadly died three years ago, and who was a brilliant genius of a thinker who bridged between deep learning and applied practice, and from whom I, I learned much and whose spirit continues to inspire, not only me and my colleagues in the company and in the university, but indeed in companies and universities worldwide. What Bill did, which I think takes him uh, beyond 
the work of many other significant figures is he combined in people, of learning about people, of studying, observing, watching people with a love of mathematics and computing and mapping and analysis. And it's that combination which um, really matters. Yes, as Jane Jacobs, William White, Jan Gale have rightly done, we, sh we must study people. People are more important than buildings. Buildings are the containers of people. We, we, we need to have a science of people. But equally, what Bill brought to this was the, the beauty of the mathematics of being able to turn the observations of people into algorithms to predict the movement and behavior, interaction and transaction of people in cities. And what I'm gonna talk about is that relationship between observing and predicting. But before I do so, let me just cover the pressing emergencies, the planetary emergencies in which our practice, your practice um, uh, exists. And those are the climate emergency, the health emergency, and an emergency of shelter. The climate emergency I think is, is most perhaps well understood and acknowledged, um, the warming planet, the carbon in the atmosphere and the need to reduce our carbon footprint, indeed eliminate our carbon footprint. The health emergency though is equally worrying, uh, the obesity, epidemic, people becoming unhealthy, overweight as a result of over-dependence on cars. And then the emergency of shelter, the importance of providing dignified shelter to people all over the planet and nowhere more profoundly exemplified than the emergency of the war in Ukraine and the damage that that has done on top of the damage of wars all over the planet and the need to properly put a roof over people's head in dignity. So I'd like to come back to these as we explore uh, other uh, project applications, which in some ways uh, are aimed at addressing these. Let's start with the environment, uh, the planetary emergency of um, our dependence on the motor car. The traffic jam is perhaps the most, the lowest common denominator of urbanism worldwide. Um, it's a very negative lowest common denominator, but it seems that in our efforts to improve ourselves as a species, we've generated traffic jams. We have to do better. We have to change the way that we think about cities. Building more roads to solve traffic congestion is as Lewis Mumford said, like loosening your belt to tackle obesity. It's the wrong approach. So we have to do things differently, not least because of the global uh, increase in the population of the planet. The urban population in particular, expected to grow from three to seven billion at least by 2050, which brings on the right of this image two characteristics. First, the informal urban population, slums, slum dwelling, unless we do things differently, expected to grow from one to three billion people. It's just not acceptable uh, to uh, a reasonable audience, uh, I argue. And alongside that, the middle class expected to grow from 1.5 billion to 4 billion. So while we have more poor people living in slums, we have more rich people driving cars eating meat, getting fat, getting unhealthy, generating carbon, unless we do things differently. Uh, as you can tell already, there's a message to what I'm saying here. We have to change the way we design. And the first urban challenge uh, must be around the way we design streets. What we have seen in the last century is that fast highways have replaced main streets in cities. So on the left, uh, as is typical of so many cities today, we're building 
highways that separate the global movement of cars from the local movement of pedestrians. In the city on the left, the buildings face away from the street. In the, building on the, in the city on the left, the property values are the lowest on the highway and increase as you go away. The city on the right is Paris, where the city is built around a street that mixes the global and local movement. And this is an old photograph of Paris. Paris is changing. Paris has reduced its speeds of vehicles to 30 kilometers, massively increased its cycling. So Paris is getting even better. Mixing movement, property values on the Champs-Élysées here are the highest. The buildings face the street. The cultural and economic benefit of this is huge. So how come we are not building more cities like Paris? Why do we continue to build cities like the city on the left? And if we were face to face, I might even ask you, um, where do we think the city is on the left? And I'll be interested to hear where, where you think that city is and, and you know, make, make a comment if you can as to where you think that city is. Um, I'd love to hear afterwards. So why? Well, the legacy of Le Corbusier is one answer. Um, I'll be interested to know if you agree with me, but the Plan Voisin is the most influential project in the history of urbanism. Uh, it is, of course, Le Corbusier's proposal to demolish the uh, center of Paris and replace it with fast highways that run between individualized buildings that face away from the street, separating global from local movement. At the time, deemed to be the future and indeed over the last century has been built in almost every city, in almost some version of this form. Now, the voisin of the plan voisin, the French word voisin, of course, means neighborhood or neighbor. And people think of this as being intended to create neighborliness between people living in towers. But the truth is the voisin is a car company and the plan voisin was sponsored by a car company. And the aim of the plan voisin was to sell cars in order for people to have to drive from where they live to where they work. This is Le Corbusier's own voisin automobile. This is car sponsored urbanism. And as Corbusier said, the intention of the plan voisin was that he could live at one end of the city, his secretary at the other, they would drive at speed, grinding gears and burning gasoline as they sped through the city to their office. This was very much intended to burn gasoline. So today, when we look at the urban footprint of this town, Skelmersdale, I said, stay here, it could be anywhere. We see the echo of the Plan Voisin, fast highways separating small pockets of urbanism. In Skelmersdale, there is a major mental health and physical health problem. I mentioned the physical health problem of obesity. The mental health problem is of loneliness. People who live in communities divided by fast highways have fewer friends. They don't have a close circle of neighbors that they can socialize with. They get lonely. The cost of loneliness in prescription drugs to make people feel better is huge. So these are the consequences of the Plan Voisin of Le Corbusier. And we need to remember that it doesn't need to be like this because for the first 9,900 years of urbanism, our cities looked very different. They looked like Florence, tightly connected in terms of their street networks, 
a set of long straight streets on which the shops locate, shorter streets on which people mostly live, walkable so that there are jobs close to where people live, connected by public spaces and parks. This was the standard template of cities for 9,900 years until Le Corbusier and others promoted an alternative approach. And so just to pause, uh, for me, the challenge is to move from the fragmented city of disconnected developments that generates car dependence, obesity, and loneliness to the integrated city of continuously connected neighborhoods based around walking, cycling, and livability. And why wouldn't you want this? Why wouldn't you want La Rambla, where people walk but drive as well? If you look to the left and right of this image, you'll see cars and motorbikes, where people work and live above shops at ground level. And of course, the landscape of the wonderful trees create shade from the sun and shelter from the wind. Why don't we keep building more streets like La Rambla? When was the last great street built in the world? We can think of the last great building. We can think of many great buildings that have been built. Why don't we build great streets anymore? Because in streets, in well-used streets, wonderful things happen. It's not just about people having a good time. In this image, people are not just having a good time. They're also doing something fundamental. I've listed eight behaviors here of beginning with somebody being present in the city and being co-present with other people. That leads to communication, whether it's just a nod or the wave of a hand, it creates contact between human beings, which is fundamental to our species. Some of those communications lead to interactions, uh, a conversation. That might lead to a transaction, a deal of some kind, a social transaction or an economic transaction. These transactions lead to often introductions being made. You introduce a friend and they start talking with your mutual friend. And after a while, people have ideas that they've never had before. It just comes up through the contact between human beings. And from those introductions, the innovations are generated. And of course, cities are then number eight, the best place to broadcast because that you have an audience on your doorstep. Taken together, the city is a transaction machine. The city is the best place to generate contact between people and ideas that help solve the problems of the future of the planet. Indeed, I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's not unreasonable to say that we build cities in order to solve problems. We build cities to generate the social and economic interactions and transactions that help us resolve our future needs. I think cities are like computers. The, the answer is in them. And we build them as extensions of our brains in order to advance ourselves as a species. So how can you understand a city? This is Bill Hillier and his colleagues contribution to uh, the science of cities. And it begins very simply. It begins with the idea that you can describe space using graph theory. And taking this really, really simple example of two rooms, A and B, the difference of one doorway makes a mathematical difference to the graph that describes them. So this doorway here, connecting B and the outside C, is represented by that line. On the right, where there is no doorway, C, the outside, connects through A to B. 
C connects through A to B. This kind of notation is a very useful way of studying the shape of buildings. If we move on to a more uh, complex building, we can use exactly the same principle to say, let's think about the building from this room that we've uh, shaded in gray. How many rooms are directly connected to it one step away? There are four of them. This room here is two steps away. You have to go through another room to get to it. So we can say it's two steps away and so on and so forth until we realize that there are two rooms here that are three steps away. Turn that plan into a graph where the bottom circle here is the room that we have colored in gray. Those are the four rooms that are one step away. Those are the three rooms that are two. And then there are two rooms that are three steps away. Add up the numbers three plus three plus two plus two plus two plus four ones make 16. The whole building is 16 steps in total away from that room. Same building, different room, draw the graph. The whole building is 30 steps away from that room. That's in essence, the mathematics of space syntax. It's no more complicated than that. It's just that the systems we look at are sometimes much bigger, like the whole of a city or the whole of a country. But the mathematics is done in the same way, just using a computer rather than a human brain. And the other little trick that we've learned is to use color for people who see the rainbow spectrum. We find that red for the most connected room, the room that's shallowest to, to the rest of the building, then orange and then green and then blue is like a heat scale to describe the depth of individual rooms in individual buildings. Where, when we move to a city, we apply exactly the same principles. We take the city and rather than divide it into rooms, we divide it into individual um, lengths of street, axial lines. We draw the longest and fewest straight lines that pass through all of the space of the city. We then treat each of these lines, or indeed each of the segments of the lines, like the rooms of the building that we just studied. We say, how many are one step away? How many are two steps away? What's the total depth of the network from each segment in turn? And imagine in a city, there may be tens of thousands of segments. So this is a calculation that the human being can do, but it would take you weeks or months or years, and an algorithm can do it in seconds. An algorithm can color up that network from the most connected street segments in red to the least in blue. And we call this property spatial accessibility. I'm gonna show you why it's a useful measure in a moment, but it's a very, very simple one. I, I can't emphasize this enough that trying to reduce things to simple measures is very important to, to not make the science of cities too complicated. Um, that was the city of Munich. Uh, here's the city of Shanghai using exactly the same principles. What can we learn from this hierarchy of hot red connected streets to cold blue ones? Remember at this stage, all we've done is measure spatial depth. There's no other information in this map. But perhaps when we start to look at the the map, we might recognize that, well, maybe these are the main streets of the city. What makes them main? Well, um, when we've got data on movement values, pedestrian movement on the left, vehicle movement on the right, we find correlations between the amount of movement and the spatial accessibility. So the more accessible streets are the ones over on the right, we find they have more movement on them. The less accessible streets on the left have less movement on them. 
both for vehicle movement and pedestrian movement. This is a scientific discovery made in the 1980s, and I think one of the most significant discoveries in the science of cities. It says that for vehicles, around 70% of the differences in the vehicle movement pattern of the city can be explained by one variable, which is spatial accessibility. And for pedestrian movement, in this case, around 60%. So when people say cities are complex and chaotic, they're not. Anyone who begins a paper or a book, I warn you, with cities are chaotic, complex uh, entities, stop reading. Cities are not. Cities have a logic. It's only once you understand the logic, you realize they're very simple. Cities organize themselves around spatial accessibility. I'll, I'll show you some more discoveries in a moment to, to develop this, but if you um, see, as we have found, from city to city, town to town, Warsaw will be the same, Paris, Berlin, Melbourne, every city we've ever looked at, we find these correlations between movement and, and accessibility. We can talk and maybe you've got some ideas about what might influence how a street is, is actually used, the quality of the urban design, the presence of a highly attractive building or um, railway station, of course, um, those, are, those factors are important. But if we treat the ac spatial accessibility correlation um, on its own, we can create a design tool. So here we have uh, a spatial hierarchy model, spatial accessibility. Um, and we've added to it this network of white streets. This is our design. We're going to, uh, this is our master plan. Is it going to work? Well, we can run the computer model again and test the connectivity of our design proposal. In this case, it doesn't work at all well. The cold blue streets are not going to be places where you'll find high levels of pedestrian or vehicle movement. They're not going to generate the footfall that makes shops vibrant. They're possibly going to be empty and attract antisocial behavior. So let's go back to the drawing board and try a different design. A design where instead we've taken streets that point at the site and drawn them together and connected them uh, at the heart of the site. And as a result, when we run this through the model, we generate far higher levels of spatial accessibility or spatial connectivity. We can then finesse this. We may not like some of the angles that we've generated. We may worry that there's too much vehicle movement. So we can narrow the streets, change the surfaces, in, improve the planting, uh, discourage vehicles from driving through, prioritize walking and cycling. We can then move from spatial design to urban design, which I think is a, is a good rule. Before we get to the urban design, certainly before we get to the architecture, we should do the spatial design. Spatial design, urban design, architectural design. Let, let's just develop the um, research findings a little further because a, a second key discovery of the Space Syntax Research Program has been how spatial accessibility influences land use viability, by which I mean where you find the shops, very simply. In London, 80% of the retail, the shops, the red, is located on the 20% most spatially accessible streets. If you're a shop, you want to be on the red and the orange routes, the highly spatially accessible ones, because most shops need footfall. If you're a luxury shop and you have a reputation, your customers will find you. But for most shops, they need footfall. They move to the spatially accessible routes. The third key discovery 
of the research is about crime. Um, criminals really understand space and spatial connectivity, and they exploit it. So here's an image of uh, domestic burglary in uh, a city in Australia. And the white dots are locations of criminal activity, of burglaries, people, criminals breaking into people's houses. You find more of them in the spatially less accessible streets. And, and this work, which won an award, was hugely influential in changing the way the police thought about the way they uh, organized their uh, patrols and the way that the local council designed its new development. It argued for more connected streets rather than less connected streets. It argued against the theory that we need to create defensible space by creating cul-de-sacs and enclaves. Instead, it demonstrated that that's what caused crime or influenced crime, not what solved crime. And a fourth key discovery <clears throat> is on the relationship between land value and spatial accessibility. As you can imagine, this discovery is very important for our clients who are property developers who are looking to optimize the value of the land that they're developing. So what we've done here is to analyze two different master plans. The master plan on the left, the streets don't connect up as directly, whereas the master plan on the right, they connect through, they generate higher spatial accessibility. By correlating spatial accessibility with land values, existing land values, it was possible to create a spreadsheet into which we could calculate future internal rates of return and net present values to demonstrate that, although we're dealing here in a, in a Chinese currency, the value difference between these two master plans, 3.35 billion, which is um, probably around four to 500 million euros. Um, and as an architect, if you can present your design proposals in financial as well as aesthetic terms, this to me is, is really important. This is when the people in gray suits sit up and pay attention to the architect uh, in my experience. So those are, those are some of the key research findings based around space alone. In practice today, we are building integrated urban models which take the spatial layout attraction, spatial accessibility of the street network, and then add to it the attraction of other features of the city. So the transport network attraction. Um, so we can tune our spatial models according to the location of public transport, bus stops, railway stations, as well as cycling infrastructure and car parks. We can add in the land use attraction of individual buildings. And we can also analyze these against the performance data of cities in terms of health, employment, and educational characteristics. In the UK, the census is carried out every 10 years. In other countries and cities, when we're working, greater public data sets are becoming available. And this means that we can test, check, analyze our spatial models against these other data sets to build more sophisticated integrated urban models, but always to try to explain the city through the eyes of the user. So space syntax can sometimes, I think, seem a little, uh, a little sterile, a little um, removed from your reality, a little top down. But in fact, we're trying to read the characteristics of the city in terms of the user. How many jobs can I get to in half an hour? Can I walk to a decent school or doctor? Am I close to shops, cafes, parks, and so on? And what's best for everyone when you look at this collectively? So we're trying to 
stay faithful, if you like, to uh, Bill's duality of human behavior observation and the science of cities, which means in practice, designing. That's what we're doing most days. We, we are designing new parts of cities and entirely new cities in some cases. So here's a master plan where we supported a lead urban designer in Darwin, Australia, to develop a scheme built around streets, built around parks and public spaces. If you like trying to emulate what we saw from Florence, using the science of cities to support this proposal for more walking and more cycling, less driving, less car parking space, but doing so using the data that the uh, modeling allowed us to generate that this master plan would generate 3.7 billion Australian dollars of new land value, not only in the master plan area to, to the right, but also in the existing city to the left. Equally in the city of Melbourne, arguing for the importance of public transport, creating a new tram route by using a model that explained how this would ultimately address some of those challenges I described at the beginning, the healthy city, the low carbon city. We're also always looking to improve the quality of our modeling and working in the Middle East, we have to acknowledge the great influence of the sun, the heat of the sun in modifying human behavior instincts. So we've learned that simple spatial models aren't sufficient. We, in this case, working with Foster and partners uh, in uh, the United Arab Emirates, we incorporated the passage of the sun into a spatial model so that we could model the interaction of spatial connectivity and shade. And of course, shade varies through the day. So we built a dynamic model to test uh, which routes were both the most direct, but also the most shaded at different times of the day. And it allowed us to tune the designs according to where commuter oriented retail might be versus the sorts of cafes and restaurants that would be more popular at lunchtime. So in summary, the, the applications of the space and tax approach uh, are typ typically applied at, in three different kinds of project. The first kind is at the city and regional scale. Often, as I've, I've mentioned, looking at the whole of a city, sometimes designing the whole of a city, sometimes it's a new public transport system, using the spatial analytics to locate new metro stations, to identify the new public transport infrastructure, buses or metros, uh, looking at the creation of um, new centers and uh, new parts of existing cities. The second kind of application is at a more uh, detailed level uh, of individual property developments. And that might be an office park or it might be a, a cultural um, area. Then moving inside buildings to uh, understand the movement and interaction of people in galleries, museums, in hospitals, in office buildings and using similar but slightly modified tools that can get down to the fine scale of people moving, sitting, interacting in buildings. Being able to observe as well how people use office spaces. For example, in one office that we studied, 80% of all conversations between people were less than one minute long. We only got that by videoing the, the office throughout the, the day, several days. And this really came as a surprise to everyone and made them think differently about how they managed the circulation spaces in which those conversations were happening. 
the idea that it wasn't about the set piece meeting. It was actually about the, you know, the set piece meeting on the Monday morning at nine o'clock. It was actually everything in between happening in the corridors between the meetings where a lot of the key transactions and interactions and innovations were occurring. And this practice comes on the back of research uh, into those two aspects of, of, um, of space syntax, the human behavior observation on the right, and then the spatial modeling on the left. And to give you a, uh, a brief overview of, of our work inside buildings, what we're looking at here is the Tate Gallery, the old Tate Gallery in London. The model on the left, if you look carefully, you might be able to see individual squares, pixels of space. Each of those becomes the a bit like the room or the street of the earlier models. It becomes the origin of a spatial calculation. The calculation is how many other pixels can be seen from where I am. And of the pixels that I can see, which are probably 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, of those that I can see, how many can they see? So it's about visibility around the corner. And then of the ones that can be seen from the ones that I can see, how many can they see? And so on and so on until you calculate the depth of the origin from the rest of the building. That one calculation gives us the red to blue spectrum across the building. And then when we observe, when we've observed 100 people for 10 minutes as they walk through the main entrance and distribute themselves around the building, we can see there's a very close similarity between the density of movement and the level of spatial accessibility. How did we observe these people? We followed them. And um, that's something which we still do a lot. Yes, we film. Yes, we can use electronic tags. Yes, we can use mobile phone data, although be very careful with mobile phone data because there are huge problems in the way that it's collected. Not always accurate. But walking slowly at a distance behind someone um, is mostly legal and, and you know, make sure it is legal if you're going to try it yourself, uh, but a very effective way of understanding how the world works. Sit on a street corner for 10 minutes, you'll learn more in 10 minutes than you will in 10 hours in a library, and you can drink a coffee at the same time. So the modeling in buildings also covers different levels. We model in the staircase, we model in the uh, escalators, the lifts, however, the ramps are changing level. And this three dimensionality is something which has always been part of space syntax, um, the way buildings connect. It's also something that we're uh, uh, looking at in terms of cities that are built across very sloping uh, grounds. And so um, this is a model which um, you may just be able to see that it has a degree of uh, three dimensionality to it, um, where we're measuring the level of slope in the model, in the streets, as well as their connectivity, so that we can uh, distinguish between flat and very steep streets in terms of if someone has a choice, which one they're more or less likely to, to take. Um, I'm going to uh, close, uh, and I can, you know, I've, I've got a lot of case studies which I can refer back to if people ask questions. I'm, I'm gonna close with some thoughts about the, uh, the future, um, sharing one last project which, um, which started to use artificial intelligence to grow the plan of a city. And this was in a competition that we undertook for the capital of Kazakhstan called Nur Sultan. Um, we were invited to the competition. We ended up winning the competition, which is wonderful. And then we, I'll show you in a moment the actual plan that we have developed for the city. But as you may know, as you may already do yourself, see a competition as an opportunity to do something you've never done before. And our idea was, could we create an algorithm that could grow a city? And in a way, that 
scientists grow molds in petri dishes and leave them overnight and come back in the morning and see what they've become. In a way, we were thinking in similar terms. What if you could let the computer design the city and sit back? Now, this isn't just about relaxing and having a, a glass of wine and letting the computer do the hard work. It's thinking about those parts of the planet where there are no architects, there are no town planners, but there is a massive need for urban planning. Um, thinking of sub-Saharan Africa, thinking of rapidly developing communities all over the planet. Indeed, um, some of the uh, most rapidly developing places are the places that have the least established infrastructures of planning and design. So could you serve an algorithm to an iPad to the village leaders whose village is gonna become a town, whose town is gonna become a city by giving them information on soil quality so that they build on maybe the poorer soil and, and leave the more productive soil, uh, flooding, slope, uh, connectivity, and so on. So I'll just take you through the story. We, we first of all identified the existing city. We, we identified a direction of growth to the south and to the east because of the prevailing wind, the, the existence of the landscape to the west and north of the city being more difficult to build on. So we chose the south and east. The first step was to say, where might noise pollution come from? We're close to the airport, so we identified the, uh, the cone of the takeoff and landing path to the airport as being a negative that we would prefer to avoid building beneath if we could. Equally, the acoustic cone from the motorway that encircles the city. The next step was to look at the risk of flooding. So we identified the presence of water. Water is something, yes, it has a negative aspect when there's flooding, but equally it has a positive aspect. People like to be on water. Can we develop to overlook water? So we just, we needed to acknowledge both parts of it. Then in terms of the soil, where is there the highest grade of agricultural soil? Where do we have existing mature trees that we don't want to remove in the development? Uh, those parameters can then be weighted and overlapped to give us more developable areas in red, less developable areas in yellow. At which point we then identified the gateways into the city, the red dots being gateway points where you could naturally expect existing streets to want to uh, run through into the new site. And at that point, we handed over to an algorithm that found pathways between all of those gateway points from the city to the mo motorway, from the motorway to the city, from the city around to the city and so on. And that algorithm having identified various paths, we then ran an optimizing algorithm to simplify those paths into the primary street network. That primary street network, we then zoomed in on and ran another algorithm to identify the secondary street network. Again, using parameters that varied to test different block sizes, different plot densities, and how those would affect the grain, the density of connections that we might then establish, and how that in turn generates block typologies. Where are the taller buildings more likely to be? Where are the deeper planned buildings more likely to be according to where the shops and where the commercial buildings are more likely to be. And we took that right down to the individual house level of the lowest density part of the development. So we, we covered the entire site with this algorithmic approach that helped us identify the, the main boulevards in red, the high density buildings, commercial and residential buildings in orange, and the less dense in yellow, which together then gave us a land use plan which using um, the existing public transport plan of the city, we could then project 
into a new public transport network. And then by elevating this according to the algorithm that gave us height and depth, we generated a three-dimensional output, which is what we um, submitted as our competition entry. Having won the competition, let me just show you what then happened, because as we learned more about the city, we understood that actually, if you were wanting to expand the city over the area that had been identified with the numbers of people that were expected to, uh, to increase in the city, the city was gonna become less dense, more car dependent, less sustainable. So we worked with the city to say that perhaps we should not grow the city. Instead, we should improve and intensify the existing city. So if we abandoned the competition submission and instead changed the design approach completely to say, let's acknowledge now that we know more about the city, the low density car dependent nature of it, Let's address the fact that uh, most people drive and few people walk. And when they do walk, the conditions in which they walk are very poor. And let's set some standards and goals for the future in terms of the amounts of active travel, the reductions in carbon emissions, the uh, access to schools and access to sporting facilities. And what that led us to was an intensification and improvement of the existing city and identification using spatial analysis of key centers, key streets, and on those streets, an urban design strategy to improve their ecological profile through landscaping and their active travel profile through walking and cycling. And it was identifying the streets rather than the iconic buildings. It wasn't about where's the Guggenheim gonna be, it was where is the Ramblas gonna be, which um, became our approach, identifying street sections and the land use mix and the movement mix along those streets, such that we could then take existing post-industrial sites and transform them into street-based urbanism of modest density in order to be able to encourage that walkability in, in the city. And um, I think I should pause and uh, allow for some, uh, for some interaction, I hope, with some thoughts uh, as I do close that where we want to go with space syntax is bringing this to the immediacy of the design process. We're developing a tool called Flow, which works off a pencil and an iPad so that you can immediately get feedback on your design sketch. Your first sketch turns into the spatial analysis. Uh, and if this video runs, this is a sense of where I hope uh, we might be able to go next in terms of automating the design process to be able to take a site, to sketch on it, either with our input or with an artificial intelligence giving us hints that immediately gets processed and allows us to then identify the movement hierarchy in the city from that, the street widths that would naturally work, wider streets where more movement is, narrower where less movement is, unless we choose to, to, to break the rules a bit, the land use allocations, and then from those elevate them into the heights of buildings uh, and do that as quickly as possible so that we can make urbanism not such the long game that I mentioned when I began to talk. Um, I'm going to pause. Uh, thanks for your attention. And I'm over to you now in terms of any questions and comments that, uh, that you have for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for, for a very interesting presentation. And uh, uh, my name is Igor Wyshuk, and uh, I have the privilege of hosting our usual Q&A after, after the uh, lectures. 
And there have been a couple of questions under, um, under our streaming. I encourage everyone to join in on the conversation. Uh, we will have a couple of um, questions from, uh, from our organizing team as well. And I, will, I would like to start with a question about basically the elephant in the room. And that's the question that, uh, that has appeared under our, um, uh, under our broadcast as well uh, about, um, about uh, the pandemic, about coronavirus and how it uh, changed the, um, the way we use cities. Because uh, I assume that, um, that probably the first uh, thing uh, that's necessary for all of your analysis is the way uh, we move around the city. And to move around the city, we have to have to go somewhere. And uh, as even our meeting today is online, how do you think um, the switch to uh, more and more of activities happening online rather than offline uh, affect your research? And do you have any preliminary conclusions uh, on what uh, has happened over the last two years? Yeah, that's a great question um, because you could almost remove the pandemic from the question and still ask the question, which is what is the influence of digital online communication to the physical on land communication that we've had in cities for millennia? Um, and, and therefore see the, the pandemic of coronavirus as an accelerant of a process that was already happening. Um, which, which um, I, I think, you know, has many dimensions. So let, let me try to, to summarize some thinking on this. Um, my firm belief, one of the words I really don't like is when people talk about the real world. When, they, when you have a conversation with someone about digital, they say, yes, but in the real world, the digital world is just as real. As the physical world, you know that for me is is baseline. We live, you know, if you have an Oculus headset, if you're a gamer, you know, if you play any kind of online game, it's real. And what's happening online is we are generating ever more sophisticated versions of physical worlds. In fact, you know, magical, impossible versions where you can fly. They're still real because you have spatial relations, you have human interaction. If you've got a headset and a microphone, you're talking to your friends who might be anywhere on the planet. You're having another kind of human um, experience than you might get in a city, but it's an equal human experience. So that, that, you know, that's maybe just one market to put down. So I'm fascinated by online worlds and the interactions and possibilities of human connection within them. However, what seems to be still, and may still be for some time, easier in cities is to meet new people, is to make friends, um, meaningful friends, and be introduced to people. In fact, you make friends by being introduced. That's why introduction in that list of, of eight behaviors, whether it was four or five or six, um, six, is so important because turning up with someone else allows you to help each other in, in a social situation. That is happening in physical space far more easily than digital space. Um, what digital space seems to be good for is what you could call second contact. Physical space is good for first contact, digital for second, because in physical space, you can, the real world, in physical space, you can sit down, spend time, um, eat and drink with other people. And in doing so, form a kind of, and I don't know if it's, if it's if it's chemical, um, I'm sure you know the the medically minded might also say that there's a chemical uh, content to a physical interaction. Um, you can have a deeper, more meaningful conversation 
then you can uh, in in uh, online space. But online spaces are good for following up once you've met someone, staying in contact with them. Um, I'm not talking about the coronavirus, not because I'm not interested. It's just I think these things are, are ha were happening anyway and have been accelerated because what's been and I wrote something, at, you know, in April 2020, just because I just, you know, what's going to happen? I, I just need to think this one through. So if anyone is interested, go to my blog. It's called The Power of the Network. And I talk about the silver lining because the silver, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. And for me, the silver lining of, of the coronavirus is that it has made us, made all of us, you know, um, uh, in every generation, more confident about being online. Uh, and these kinds of, you know, sharing screen, and I didn't mess up too badly, I don't think, uh, you know, time, if I could sort time out, I, th I think I've now managed share screen, mute microphone, all of those things that are going to be, for the rest of humanity, the essential human behaviours, alongside eating and drinking in physical space. So I think the coronavirus has had a very positive um, impact in that sense. Of course, it's been appalling in every other sense. Well, maybe not every other sense, but because there are other silver linings. Um, the localism that came through lockdown of not being able to go to work, having to work from home, um, being in streets, taking exercise, all of those have, um, I think, made us more aware of the importance of active travel, walking, cycling rather than driving. Um, the silver lining of the energy crisis of the price of petrol will be that we will drive less and recognize the benefits of walking more, cycling more. So um, if, if I perhaps just add one case from my experience, I've been campaigning for, uh, it's six years now, to reduce the speed limit in the town where I live outside of London from uh, 30 miles an hour to 20, you know, from 50 kilometers to 30 kilometers. The coronavirus made it happen because the government introduced new funding to support walking and cycling because they recognized that, that people needed to be able to travel around when public transport was not available. And that funding and the relaxation of public consultation processes actually meant that they could do it faster. So there have been, there've been many silver linings. I've, I've taken a long time to answer the question, but I think it's a really, really important one. And maybe I haven't done it justice, but those are my immediate thoughts on this. Uh, the question that also appears uh, here, um, speaking of your, your answer right now, and, and I think it's a, it's a fair point, is about how it, uh, how lockdown influences the younger generations, because uh, maybe we um, were able to adapt to this, this situation as uh, you know older people adults more um, more comfortably but what about younger generations and uh, and how um, the inability to socialize and to uh, and to have contact with uh, with mates at, at a younger age might uh, might influence uh, their well, basically development and their um, um, and their approach to cities later on. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. With um, uh, two children of our own, one who was mostly at school or not at school for the last two years, not with friends for that. Yeah, I, and in, in some ways it's helping me with the answer I gave previously, which is about the fundamental importance of physical space for first contact when you're young you want to meet new people, you want to, it's perhaps less important, it's not unimportant, but it's perhaps less important to older people with more established social networks. And not being able to do that easily online 
is you know if i if i could invest in in a solution uh, a digital solution that was a, around introduction online you know genuine social and economic benefit of meeting new people online you know not not like a kind of dating agency but it's something that was really you know like beyond linkedin you know linkedin is great but you don't really meet people on linkedin you you meet their cv i don't want to meet someone's cv i want to meet them we haven't you know if if someone has the answer to that then i'll perhaps you know i'd love to be an investor small investor but i think that's the big problem that hasn't been solved online well some say that the metaverse will be the answer but i don't know if you uh, agree with it i i hope it is no i i do because what um uh you know i i got my oculus headset and i'm kind of it's sort of is that it at the moment is that it i can ride a roller coaster and fly a plane and you know meet some dragons but i i want to have a meaningful business conversation uh in the metaverse it's going to happen because it's happening you know if you if you see what the developers are doing it's happening but it isn't there yet microsoft teams is there now and it wasn't 3 years ago so let's hope that we're going to see an acceleration of the next generation of three dimensional because i think it is spatial it's about you you're seeing something uh, you're talking to someone that you want to talk to and then someone walks up that's what happens in physical space it's fundamental to the continuation of our species both economically and socially but it doesn't happen online yet and and unless someone can point me to some place i've not yet found but assuming it will happen um what should be the response uh from the physical world what should for example be the approach of uh, city planners on how to how to bring people back to to the real life to the cities uh, to cities and make them more attractive than than the virtual life yeah well um it's about walking not driving to put it really simply um and i mean maybe i'm i'm optimistic and my glass is always more than half full because it's sort of my job and and the clients who who we work with um are the clients who want this to happen so i kind of i live my days very optimistically seeing brilliant things happen around the world um cities moving towards a kind of slower more landscaped version of urbanism than what we've had for the last 100 years and and you know i i've mentioned 20 miles an hour 30 kilometers an hour um that is just happening amazingly and rapidly and acceleratingly across the world and that to me um is often when when people say what do i do first you know do i build a guggenheim do i build a central square do i just slow the city to 30 kilometers don't you know it's cheap but it's the most cost effective fastest move that you can make in a city don't end, don't stop there but that's the first thing slow the city to 30 kilometers um and and so that's where i think that's how cities should be responding to not the threat of online because it it i don't think it, it, it online is only a threat if you carry on with a 20 20th century version of the city um it, so you have to work with online to make your city somewhere where you um you live part of your day online you live part of your day with the headset off the gloves off whatever it is you've been wearing off and and you're outside in nature uh so the next thing is is um um planting you know once you've once you've slowed the traffic you narrow the road width the road lanes 
you create more space for walking and more space for planting, low level, medium level, high level planting. And, and again, you know, so there's no Guggenheim, it's just slow traffic and trees. And it's cheap, it's cheap, cheap, cheap. But I'm I'm thinking if really slow traffic and trees will be uh, will be enough. And I think um, a couple of weeks weeks ago I was in Copenhagen and was visiting this uh, uh, fairly new district uh, of uh, Urestal uh, where all of the uh, um, shiny buildings by Bjar Kingels and, uh, and and his acolytes are um, are being constructed and. Uh, you know, there is a 30 mile per hour um, speed limit, there are trees, there are bike lanes, but uh, uh, there are no cafes, there are no places where you can, uh, where you can spend your time. And uh, we've been talking with, uh, with an owner of one of the cafes and he was like, it's, we call it Danish ghetto because uh, people only uh, uh, go to the city center when when they want to spend their free time and there is no nowhere to go in in their uh, immediate vicinity yeah well I'm, I'm, I I know of but I've not visited the, the development you're um, describing and I've learned never to talk about somewhere you've never been um, it's always perilous so okay what else um, we've been um, developing what we call the walkability index and the input to that is a combination of um, land use mix and spatial connectivity so you know your, your uh, land use mix would be my next you know what, what do you do slow the traffic green the streets mix the land uses which means Live, as I said in one of the slides, living on the Rambler, live above the shops, walk to work, or have, give people the choice to walk to work. You don't make anyone do anything, but give them the choice to walk to work. Um, what was the land use mix like in the Danish development that you were in? Was it all living or was it all working or a mix? The majority was uh, was living and it was uh, even on the ground floors you had, uh, you had apartments. So uh, there were no places for cafes, shops, etc. Only right, like okay. uh, near the near the uh, metro station, uh, near the train line that, that's connecting this part of, of town, there was like a shopping mall, you could say, yeah, or, okay. a bigger, or a bigger store. Right. So if I was um, wanting to create a walkable community, I wouldn't be building a shopping mall and houses. I, you, know, you, you need offices, you need um, uh, public services, schools, and healthcare facilities mixed with offices, mixed with galleries and studios and architecture uh, departments next to where people live. And, and, you know, the office park, the housing estate, the leisure center, these are all 20th century concepts that have destroyed our cities. We've had a couple of questions on uh, on your methodology and uh, what parameters do you uh, do you use in in your research and um, it is also connected to, to, to my to my previous questions because you've mentioned um, uh, well at least from the presentation I had the, um, I had the impression that the um, aspect of accessibility is uh, is the main aspect and i i was trying to figure out if you uh, incorporate um, other factors for example um, the quality of space and does it um, does it influence the result for example uh, how let's say nice so to speak or clean or or tidy, uh, or tidy the uh, the street, the area is. What other factors do you uh, do you incorporate yeah. in, in your research? I mean, I mean, what's great being connected to not just the um, School of Architecture at UCL, um, but schools of architecture, planning, urbanism all over the world, is that there are 
I mean, in China, there are tens of thousands of space syntax students and researchers. I mean, it's there are there are more space syntax researchers in China than the rest of the world put together. Um, so it's in you know the tens of thousands. Is each one of them? I don't know each one of them, but many of them is trying to prove it doesn't work, um, and and try or trying to add something that they think is missing. And quite right that they do, because I did the same when I when I did my master's degree with Bill in 1990, um, I studied Manhattan because I wanted to prove that space syntax wouldn't work in a regular grid. Uh, and it, it was just a Western European theory. Um, and I was completely wrong. Um, and Bill sat me down very, you know, um, uh, diligently and showed how Manhattan was not regular. Broadway and Central Park and the West and East Village. And, and they, that's enough to turn a supposedly regular grid into something way more structured and sophisticated. And it had a spatial hierarchy and it correlated with the pedestrian movement observations I'd done. Um, that's one half. And it's not really the answer that you're looking for, but I, it, to me, it's it's important that, that people do add more. So does lighting make a difference? Does um, the uh, biodiversity of a city make a difference? Have a go um, and ask yourself a difference to what? What is it we're trying to do? I think one of the mistakes people um, naively or otherwise make um, when they look at space in Texas is to say it's all about predicting movement. It's about predicting pedestrian movement. It's a pedestrian modeling tool. It, it, it is, but it's also got many other uses. It, 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 pedestrian modeling is in some ways the, um, the skin, um, the kind of the, the thing you see first. But deeper in this are aspects of social and cultural relationships, gender, age, ethnicity, how did different societies use space differently? That was Julianne Hansen, Professor Julianne Hansen, who was Bill Hillier's partner academically um, and wrote the social logic of space with Bill, had a particular ethnographic interest in communities and with Bill identified that different communities put space together in different ways, uh, especially domestically. Um, the way we eat and drink, the objects, the way they're placed on the table, the hand we use to eat with, the tools we use, these are all aspects of space syntax. Um, they just don't really make it into the mainstream in a lot of space syntax discussions, but they're the fundamentals. Um, so I would say, you know, what are we really trying to explain? Is it land value? Is it air pollution? Is it um, biodiversity? Is it uh, the way men, the way women use space? What's the question? You know, that's what Bill would always, always say with every project, you know, whether it was a railway station with Norman Foster or an office building with um, Frank Geary. Um, it didn't matter. It was what's the question? What are they trying to do? And 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 so I would I would ask every person interested in space syntax to consider what am I actually trying to do here? Um, on the one hand, practice and rehearse the methodologies that we've developed over over decades, which are um, the online training platform. Um, it's free and accessible. Uh, sets out many of these methodologies. Um, that's kind of copying space syntax, which is fine, because you know, that's how you train. You, you copy someone. When you learn to, to sing or play an instrument, you play someone else's music first, you, you master it, and then you move on and write your own. Spatial analysis is rightly at the core of space syntax. The 012 tree that I drew at the beginning is, is there in terms of spatial hierarchy in almost all of space syntax. 
But what it's there to describe and what it's there to interact with depends on the question. Um, and as I mentioned, I'll make this the last thing I say, because I could talk a lot about this. Uh, last thing I say for now, as I mentioned when describing the integrated urban model or the IUM, as we abbreviate it to in the practice, the integrated urban model, that takes spatial attraction, transport attraction, land use attraction, boom, 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 space, land use, transport, and combines them. And uh, it then creates a set of measures for buildings or for streets against which you can attach data. You can say, what is the property values on this street? What is the air pollution level on this street? These are the output performance data. So you've got input, which is space, land use, transport, and output, which is something social, something educational, something health, something environmental, something economic. Input output is, is a useful way that, that I find to think about this. Um, my more sophisticated research colleagues tell me I'm, you know, it's not as simple as that, but, but for me in practice, it's good to be that simple and my clients seem to understand it. Speaking of tools, one of the questions that, uh, that appeared uh, under our broadcast was uh, uh, whether this um, technology and the flow app that you mentioned uh, will be available. How will it, will, will it be available? Oh, I, wish, um, I wish I could answer that definitively. Um, we've undertaken a feasibility study for flow um, and we are seeking second round investment. I think that's the official um, way of describing it. So we've had first round investment. We've developed a proof of concept feasibility study. Um, we're, we're ready for the second round and we are actively seeking investors. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's one aspect of something which is very important to us, um, which is the dissemination of space syntax. Yeah, um, we, we again to give a diagram in three parts. Space syntax is, for me, about applying techniques that already exist that have been developed over the last 30 years. So it's applying them in practice. It's just getting it out there and getting it used on development projects, on design projects, app applying. The second part is developing. That's about improving the techniques, creating new ones. Um, and the third part is disseminating. And that means sharing in some way, whether it's free or not free, the methodologies, the technologies that we've, and the data that we've created and making space syntax every day. You know, my personal ambition, the reason, one of the reasons that, that I do the job I do is space syntax is amazing, but it's not accessible to the mainstream. How do we make it accessible? We cannot afford for everyone to do a master's degree, never mind, a, 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 or even a, a PhD, um, and spend years developing their skills. That's why I'm, because the planet doesn't have time. That's why I'm interested in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and really simple bits of software that anyone with something like this and something like this can sketch and, and, and not only get the answer quickly, but use their hand and, and use the, the technique of drawing, which is fundamental to the architect, to the, to the designer, uh, rather than, you know, that and that, which are approximations for, for this. So, um, yeah, I don't know, three years for flow. So fingers crossed. We have a question from our own Victoria. Hi, I read that you work in collaboration with the NHS on healthy new towns. And I was wondering 
uh, because usually when we talk about space syntax, we talk about more social aspect uh, or commerce, car traffic, etc. And I wondered uh, what was your approach uh, and what actually did you do with those healthy new cities, towns? Sorry, healthy new towns. Yeah, we worked on um, one to begin with, and it developed a relation that has led to something else, which um, so which I'll mention. Um, we we came in too late to make a big difference. You know, to to um, I, I won't name where it was or you know because but we came in too late to make a big difference. The footprint of the place that we were looking at had been largely established, and we were um, uh, only able to make small recommendations. But the aim of the work was to encourage walking and cycling uh, and to avoid car dependence. Um, what that did though, was encourage us uh, to develop a tool called the Walkability Index, uh, which we've now built for the whole of the United Kingdom because we've got access to free data. Uh, we, we've bought some and some of it is free on the spatial network the transport timetable and the land registry, what is in each building. And we've spent a couple of years linking it together and writing scripts that, that join the data so that we can now create the walkability profile for any part of the UK. So that, that, that was one benefit. Um, the second was a relationship that we developed with one of the um, nearby uh, uh, authorities, local authorities, local governments, um, which led to the development of a tool um, called the um, Active Travel Explorer. And what that does is, again, it, it mashes the data, but it uses some very simple AI to very quickly propose a cycling network for a town. Um, on the basis most towns don't have cycling networks um they, they might have a little bit of cycle path in them but nothing really comprehensive and so what it does is it looks at the character the spatial characteristics the land use characteristics is there a school where we should be paying special attention is there a railway station where we should be also aware that we're going to have more potential traffic and it gives local authority planning officers a first proposal for a cycle network, which might save them six months. It might save, you know, I don't know how many pounds or, or euros worth of investment. Uh, and it, it, I can trace that tool back to that project. Okay, thank you so much. And we have a question from our Dean as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim, for the lecture. It was really interesting. And I have two comments and one question. Uh, first of all, about you mentioned uh, the popularity of space syntax in China. And uh, due to the research we recently did, uh, I may also see it as a result of totally different approach to gathering data about people in China and in, in the Western world. So if, if we speak that we may be tracked in the Western world, then we feel like a bit, of, a bit at least a bit uncomfortable with this. But actually, uh, we found that it's totally different approach in, in uh, Far East uh, and the collectivity of such society makes a difference. So uh, I guess there's a lot more data available there uh, concerning the uh, people behavior. Uh, this is one uh, remark. And the other remark is uh, that I totally agree with, with the um, idea of the first contact, however Star Trekish it may sound, uh, <laughs> uh, because, uh, and I have the real uh, life example with the scientific conferences, which were, which moved to the uh, virtual world for two years, but actually, they were fueled only by these contacts we made before. Yeah. There were no new contacts. So we could continue 
but to make new contacts, new alliances in the scientific world. We had to come back to real world conferences. We had to meet face to face, to talk to people, to know them. And uh, actually, so every new benefit is from the uh, physical world, uh, also in the, uh, in the scientific society. And the question is, um, uh, since space syntax is there, I see a huge advancement advance in um, neuroscience, for example. And do you see uh, any uh, place of alignment of these two, uh, two things, I mean, space syntax and the way that we perceive space, that we uh, orient ourselves in space, like the, I believe, 2014 Nobel Prize for Mosers and John O'Keefe, who they, they found and they described our internal GPS that actually builds kind of almost physical model of the space inside of our brains. Yeah. So do you think there is a kind of potential between uh, those two, like new findings on, on neuroscience and orientation in space and space syntax? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dean, for, for the question and the comments. Um, on, on China, um, I mean, just, just a remark, there's, there's way, way more data on human behavior, um, but it's not accessible to someone like me. So um, what we've done, actually, we, we used drones in one city in China, um, quite large industrial drones to observe. And it was fascinating. I mean, just amazing technology. Um, I mean, we see the dreadful destruction that drones can cause, but in, it just shows that the same technology can do something positive as well. Amazing pictures steady all day long of vehicle movement and pedestrian movement. And that sort of data is so valuable, um, especially when you can use uh, uh, an algorithm to automatically count the observations from the drone. So that, that makes me excited about, about future technologies. Um, yeah, the Nobel Prize winning work in 2015 or 14, whatever the year was, um, uh, Professor O'Keefe, who's at UCL um, in and the neuroscience department, I was lucky enough to be invited to um, join one of their events uh, in, the, in the real world uh, of a lecture theater at, at UCL. And um, I learned so much. And, and I think the, the fir fertilized cross-fertilization between the neuroscientists and the spatial scientists and, and architects generally is something which um, I, would, I would encourage others to explore um, because of this spatial discovery. And, and as I remember it, probably badly, but their, their description of the grid cell and the node cell as soon as I heard it, it was like, they're talking about a city. Um, and that made me think about the fact that every town and city ever built until the sort of early mid 20th century is a grid. Sometimes more regular, uh, sometimes less regular, less regular when there's more topography when the street is following the slope, following the water, more regular when the land is flat or when the, um, uh, the, the, the military builders, the colonial military builders, you know, whether they were British or Spanish or Portuguese or whatever, would lay it out in military lines, regardless of topography. Um, but we've had rec rec rectilinear, regular grids, from the earlier cities, Mesopotamian cities. Um, they're not just New York. Um, Teotihuacan in Mexico, you know, ancient regular city. Um, and it's almost given the choice, we build these grids. And I, that's why I think we build our brains. Cities are extensions of our brain. The, the human species comes together and its version of living together 
is a bigger version of its own brains because the anatomy of those, uh, the cognitive cortex in which navigation is, it takes place towards the, I think it's at the lower back of the brain, um, is wired as a grid. Uh, the difference I have is that their diagrams are all triangular. Their grid is a triangular grid, and, and it's a conversation I've not yet had the opportunity to have. But I'd love to know, um, yeah, are they really triangular or are they cutting a cube at 45 degrees when you get triangles? So because triangles, we don't have triangular cities. The human species has never built a triangular grid apart from uh, Haussmann triangulating across Paris or L'Enfant in DC, you know, planned. But generally speaking, if you're in a, uh, and my, my research colleagues who, you know, immerse people in virtual worlds um, can play with this and, and find out the degree to which people get lost or not in more rectilinear versus le less rectilinear, more triangular grids. And we, the brain doesn't do triangles very well. If we genuinely are wired as a triangle, but prefer to build rectangles, I don't know what that means, but it's got to be interesting, hasn't it? It surely is. And one uh, one final question that, that I have that uh, for me would be interesting as well. Are there glitches in your research? Some yes, things that stand out and, yep. and what? Could you elaborate a little bit on them? Yeah, I will, because I think it's really important to um, the scientific process that, that you acknowledge mistakes. And, and sometimes not just that you've made a mistake, because, um, and again, training with Bill, this was a sort of wonderful research um, training that would involve him organizing all of his windows on his really early Macintosh laptop to be perfectly aligned uh, for no other reason that it gave him something to um, relax his brain before he started to think. It was like a like yoga, but it was just organizing the windows on his laptop. That was one. Um, he was, I think he got used to the correlation, but there was a correlation between spatial accessibility and movement uh, to the point where he was able to say why the anomaly what is it why does that street why does that location not follow the theory and it's either because the data is wrong someone counted badly made it up which we've had you know people have gone to the pub and taken the money and made up the numbers they're the easiest ones to spot um, or, so either the data was collected badly or the spatial model is wrong, you've missed a connection somewhere, really common. Ah, they, 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 we haven't quite linked those streets correctly. And so they're, they're blue and then you connect them, they're red and suddenly there's no anomaly anymore. That, the, the first one, data collection problems, 5%. Spatial modeling problems, 90%, which leaves 5%, which is, I don't know what's going on there. There's something we've never seen before. Ah, there's, there's, a, there's a subset of that, which is there was construction work. It, the road was closed. Um, someone was having a party. There, there was something going on that was non-normal. Um, or it's the exit of a tube station and we hadn't realized something like that. But then there's this little one, which is, we just don't know. That's exciting. That would get Bill excited once he, and, and because he lived to disprove his own theories. And that's the mark of a great scientist. And I, I think that's um, uh, Pop, Popper, Karl Popper, um, conjecture and refutation. You know, you, you conject, think of an idea, and then what you have to do is demolish it. And if you can't demolish it, it's a good idea. And it's a theory is only a theory if, it, if it's refutable. I think that was Popper's point. You, have, you can't just say, 
and, and this is the problem in architecture. So much theory is, is not really theory. It's just an idea. Um, a theory has to have a scientific basis that it can be disproven. It has to be based on some form of evidence, some form of analysis. Otherwise, it's just, it's just an idea. And, 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 and people say, oh, I've got a theory. You don't. You've got an idea. But a real theory, an empirical theory, um, you need to be able to disprove. And, and so where we are today is as good as we've done so far. But tomorrow we might, you know, we're not going to throw it all up, throw it all, tear it all up and throw it away. But we might stop doing something we've done before and, and replace it with something else. And, and there's a lovely moment where someone has a new piece of software. It rivals, you know, what we do today is not what we were doing 10 years ago. We've transitioned. Those transitions are painful. They're costly, but they're necessary in order to, to use the best theory that you've got. Um, but what we do is not perfect and it's full of itches to answer your question um, and if we had longer I might tell you what some of them are <laughs> you have to find out for yourself but I know what the current algorithm that's very popular in the space syntax world which is a brilliant algorithm game changing in its ability to calculate not just distance but angular deviation a real innovative breakthrough it, it um it approximates and it we're about to launch a new graph engine which um, i think the reason we haven't launched it yet is we haven't got a good name for it i mean you know, there's a, there's another reality of scientific discovery we need to call it the something um in fairness it's a couple of weeks away that doesn't make it, that doesn't approximate anymore it does absolutely every calculation so is it a glitch? <laughs> but we live for people to say it doesn't work. And 95% and of the time we can explain why it doesn't work because they haven't done it right or something was going on. Then it's the 5%, that's the really fascinating stuff. Well, I guess we'll have to invite you back uh, sometime in the future to, uh, to get to know a little bit more about what you're doing right now. In the in digital my, uh, world or in the real world? Hopefully the real world. The physical world. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm falling foul of my own creation. Thank you. And meanwhile, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, our guest today was Professor Tim Stoner. And uh, uh, to everyone watching, uh, please uh, do check our channels and follow us and uh, look out for, uh, for our next, um, next meetings, next events. And meanwhile, I would like to wish everyone a pleasant evening. And Professor, if you could stay with us a little bit more. <laughs>